All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, the Apostle Paul said, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints was this grace given to preach unto the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery which for ages hath been hid in God who created all things, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to His eternal purpose, which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now observe that the purpose of the church is to make known the manifold, that is, the limitless wisdom of God in this whole world. Oh, and that was in the eternal purpose of God. So the church is the consummation of the labors of God, of the love of God, of the grace of God that brings fallen humanity into a conciliatory relationship with His Maker. We've never really appreciated the church. Men want to divide it, and of course the division within the Lord's church in the New Testament was soundly condemned. Oh, and instruction was given for correction. Uh, division is wrong in the church or in the religious world today, made up of basically uh, good people, upright morally, they are honest and sincere, and they are deeply religious, and yet just divided beyond description. It is amazing. As a matter of fact, uh, about 2,000 differing religions in this country today, uh, that gives evidence of the fact that there are 2,000 different doctrines being taught. For we are what we are by virtue of what we've been taught, that is, from a religious or spiritual standpoint. Now those who believe and obey Christ are Christians. They are Christians. Now those who believe the manual or the discipline or the catechism or the Book of Mormon, on and on and on, are something else. No, no. They have added to, oh sure, sure. They use the name Christian. That does not make it uh, scriptural. Uh, no, sir. You see, Jesus made it very, very clear that we must abide within the framework of His teaching. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the teaching hath both the Father and the Son. Oh, and He went further. If one come unto you and bring not this teaching, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed partaketh of the evil of his deeds. Now let's uh, make a statement here, since uh, we've been hearing some unusual uh, things about even brethren uh, today. Is, uh, is John here saying that as a Christian, I am to have nothing at all to do with people who are in religious error? No. That's not what he's saying at all. Uh, suppose uh, someone breaks down in the middle of the night and uh, he doesn't have a phone and uh, he, he's in strange territory and, and he knocks on your door. Uh, fine, well, come on in, friend. I hate it that you've broken down, but we have an extra bed and, uh, you know, if you need a bite or some a drink, uh, fine, uh, come on in. And so you put him up for the night, feed him breakfast the next morning. Well, it turns out, that he is a denominational preacher. Fine, that has nothing to do with it at all. Now, if you indicate that the reason you helped him is because of the religion that he espouses, then you are part and parcel of that religion. You are partaker of the evil of his deeds. Well, certainly not. Christianity is doing good to one's fellow man. Oh, but Christianity does not 
condone error. No, we're not to be mean. Well, why, certainly not. If, if he explained, and he probably would have when he came to the door, he said, Do you, I'm a, this minister or that kind of minister. Uh, fine, uh, come on in. Hey, you need help. You're a fellow human being. Be glad to do that. And if indeed the discussion of religion comes up, then you be sure that you just stand where the Lord stands. You don't condone religious error. And you're not condoning religious error by helping this man in his time of need. Well, certainly not. That's a part of Christianity. But today, if we aren't careful, eh, we hear occasionally of people who are inviting false teachers to fill their pulpits. Oh, and they uh, just have regular, you know, uh, association and fellowship with them. Now, if your intent and purpose is to teach the truth to these people who are involved in religious error, that's fine. Uh, that uh, is a noble design. Oh, but if you're just uh, going along and, uh, you know, you're having fellow, you're sinning, you're sinning grossly. We are not to have fellowship with religious error. And so that's what John is talking about. If any come unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. That is, do not aid him because of what he is, and thus indicate that you are in favor of the error that he teaches. No, sir. Uh, that won't work. We simply cannot do that. So the purpose of the church and the world is to make known the will of God. Oh, and all of the will of God is recorded in this book. We cannot go beyond or fall short. We cannot add to, subtract from, or substitute for what is said in God's Word. This is His all-sufficient, inspired Word. And so if any man speak, as Peter said, 1 Peter 4, verse 11, let him speak as the oracles of God. And Paul required in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, you remember, I beseech you therefore, brethren, through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfected together in the same mind and the same judgment. Now somebody says, yeah, well, now there are divisions in the church. Why, sure there are. Uh, that's what he's talking about right there. He's talking to the church at Corinth. Somebody said, which church? What are you talking about? There weren't any different churches until several hundred years after the New Testament was written. Uh, no, this was the church uh, established by the inspired apostles, uh, which belongs to Jesus Christ. And that's what we are concerned with uh, by way of discussion for the next few moments. The church, <coughs> its purpose Make known the manifold wisdom of God. Where is this wisdom made manifest? In the written, revealed, all-sufficient, totally authoritative revelation called the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. So we just teach what the Lord said, nothing more, nothing less. And whosoever goes beyond that in his teaching or in his association or who favors that which is contrary to God's will will lose his soul. So this thing is very, very serious. The church is to make known the will of God. Well, what about, uh, what about this church that you're talking about, preacher? Uh, who is its uh, founder? Oh, Christ is the founder uh, of the church. Oh, no question about that. You remember what Paul said as he addressed the elders of the church at Ephesus? Uh, Acts chapter 20, you recall? Uh, verse 17 says, He called unto Himself the elders of the church at Ephesus, uh, though He's in the city of Miletus. But He said this to them. He said, Take heed unto yourselves, unto the whole flock, over which the Holy Spirit hath made you bishops, to feed the church of the Lord, which He hath purchased with His own blood. That's verse 28 of Acts chapter 20. Christ purchased the church with His own blood. Right. What is involved in that statement? Well, of course, we won't have time in a single program uh, to deal with all that is involved in the purchase of the church. Now, we've noted many times, Hebrews 9.22, without shedding of blood is no remission. Uh, Christ shed His blood. Uh, the, the background for that? Oh, the wages of sin is death. Uh, Romans 6.23, you remember. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, Romans 3 at verse 23. 
Oh, and when Adam sinned, the human family was alienated from God. And that's what the Bible is all about. God's instruction, His teaching, exemplification, uh, types and shadows, and ultimately the sending of His Son to effect the reconciliation of fallen humanity uh, to Himself. So all of the Old Testament, for instance, as we've often noticed in Exodus chapter 12, you remember the tenth plague on Egypt, the death of the firstborn, both man and beast in every house? Oh, but God told Israel, uh, to take a lamb, eight days to a year old, a male, and, and put him up. And on the fourteenth day, he said, of this first month, slay that lamb. Oh, and when you slay it, take a bunch of hyssop uh, vegetation, dip it in the blood, and sprinkle it on the lentils and on the doorposts. And he said, stay in that house. Now he said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. I'll not permit the avenger to enter into the houses where you are. And that night, in every house in Egypt, the firstborn, man and beast, was dead. Not one Israelite uh, perished. So then we refer to that, and the Bible does, as the Passover lamb, right? And the Jewish nation established a, an annual feast at the instruction of the Almighty, the Passover uh, feast. Well, you recall that Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Purge out the old leaven, that you may become a new lump, even as you are unleavened. For our Passover hath been sacrificed, even Jesus. What does he mean that Jesus is our Passover? Friends, I'm the sinner. The wages of sin is death. I have no hope. I cannot redeem my soul by giving my life. That's out of the question. Oh, but Jesus came the sinless for the sinful, the pure for the impure. Oh, friends, He died in my stead. That's what Paul's talking about in Philippians 2, 5. He said, Have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. Oh, so then Jesus Christ took upon Himself flesh and blood, right, made in the likeness of uh, men. Why would He do that? Oh, since then the children are sharers in flesh and blood, He also Himself partook of the same, that through death He might bring to naught him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might deliver all them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Why did Christ come in the flesh? Oh, to die in my stead. Him who knew no sin, He made to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 at verse 21. We see Him who hath been made a little lower than the angels, even Jesus, who because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God He should taste of death for every man. That's Ephesians 2, or rather Hebrews 2 at verse 9. So Jesus died in my stead. Right. So then when Paul said here in verse 28 of Acts chapter 20 that he purchased the church with his blood, oh, that is the significance of it. You see, when he shed his blood, he validated his covenant. Uh, where a testament is, as we've noticed many times, there must also of necessity be the death of him that made it. And for a testament is a force where there hath been death, for it doth never avail while he that made it liveth. Now that's from Hebrews 9, 16 and 17. Now, what are we saying? When Christ died, He validated a system of instruction through which I can be reconciled to God. Now, as we've noted earlier many times, that instruction was inspired of the third person in the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. So the apostles inerrantly recorded God's divine revelation. So the instruction in this book leads me to a point of acceptance with God. How does that occur? When the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses my sin. But uh, when does that occur? Well, this covenant was validated, made authoritative by the blood of Christ. Now, I need to hear what He said about human redemption. But more than just hearing it, I need to believe it. Except you believe that I am He, Jesus said, you will die in your sins. John 8, verse 24. And without faith, it's impossible to be well pleasing to Him. 
uh, Hebrews 11 at verse 6. Oh, but then I hear Jesus saying, except you repent, you'll perish, Luke 13, 3, and also in verse 5. And I hear him saying that I am to confess him before men, Matthew 10, 32 through 34. And I hear him say, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. What do I do about this? I just do what he said. I walk by faith. Uh, faith cometh of hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Oh, but when you do what He said do in this blood-sealed covenant, then you are cleansed in the blood of Christ. Why, certainly. Don't you know, brethren, that all we who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead but the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. That's Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. So then His blood was shed in His death, John 19, 34, right. And I am buried with Him by baptism into His death, right. That's why I am raised from the waters of baptism a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 at verse 17. Thus to walk in newness of life, in Romans 6 at verse 4. Oh, that's the only way a sinner such as I can be saved. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son, now this is quite literal, keeps on cleansing us from all unrighteousness, at 1 John 1 at verse 7. That's the way a sinner such as I can stand in a right relationship with God. It is through the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. So then those who have been cleansed in the blood of Christ make up the church. Yes, the church is the called out body. That's the significance of it. Called men out of darkness into His marvelous light, 1 Peter 2 at verse 9. Ah, friends, we're called to be saints. Well, there's no question about that. Romans chapter 1 at verse 7. Uh, this calling is divine. Oh, and it's through the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, Paul said, We're bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, for that God chose you from the beginning unto salvation in sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto He called you through our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when I hear, believe, and obey, the instruction contained in this book called the Good News, uh, Glad Tidings, Gospel, then I am cleansed in the blood that made this testament valid. Uh, that's certainly true. Oh, well, then that makes me a member of the church. Why, sure. You see, verse 47 of Acts chapter 2 says, The Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. The church is the community of the redeemed. And in that 47th verse of Acts chapter 2, uh, you could ask the question, who are these people? Oh, just back up there in chapter 2, and Peter preached the death, the burial, resurrection of Christ. Preached the gospel to these people. They were cut to the heart. They believed it. They said, brethren, what shall we do? Well, Peter said to these believers, repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, that's by the authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's for, in order to, the remission of your sins. That's the way it's done. Oh, these are the people the Lord added to the church. Right, verse 41, they that gladly received His word were baptized, and there were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. So when you talk about the founder of the church, you're talking about Jesus Christ. He purchased it with His own blood. Oh, but it's interesting as you continue, He built it. He did what? He constructed, He built uh, the church. Uh, when he came into the parts of Caesarea Philippi, you remember, he asked his disciples, saying, uh, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, or the Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Uh, but he said, Who say ye that I am? Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon, bar Jonah, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But notice specifically, that's of course from Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19. Oh, but notice that 18th verse. 
He said, and we'll talk about the foundation later, but it just simply the term, upon this rock, this eternal truth that you've confessed, I will build my church. How will he build the church? You see, the church is made up of individual members. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Uh, 1 Corinthians, you remember chapter 12, beginning at verse 12. And the Lord is saying, I'm going to build my church. Yes, uh, maybe we could say a figurative expression like you might say to someone, I'm going to build me a house. What do you intend to do? Just say pow or some magic word and boom, they're <laughs> no, no, board plank by plank. That's the way that thing's done. Yes, sir. Building a house. Yes, sir. Lay the foundation. Ah, uh, friends, we put the girders, the beams, etc. Piece by piece. Uh, the Lord is going to build His church, right. Oh, and the church is made up of those who are redeemed, cleansed in the blood of Christ. That's true. So then it's piece by piece, isn't it? One at a time. Each individual is an immortal soul. Oh, that's what's involved in the Great Commission. Before His ascension, Jesus commissioned His apostles. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In Mark 16 and verse 15. Why would He say that? Well, because the gospel is God's power to save those who will believe it. Romans chapter 1 at verse 16. And so this gospel must be preached to all men. Oh, because each individual is independent from every other individual. That is, he is an immortal spirit possessed of free moral agency. He is a creature of choice. God wants him to have the choice, the opportunity to hear the good news so that he can make a decision. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. How can I know about heaven? How can I know about the God who loves me? How can I know about the sacrifice that He made in the giving of His precious sinless Son to redeem my soul? Friend, that's all written. That's all found here in the gospel. That's why this gospel is to be preached to every creature in all the world so that we can make a proper decision. And it, it's interesting that the Lord talks about that decision, doesn't He? Uh, just after He gave that commission, uh, Mark 16, verse 15, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Oh, the result, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieveth shall be condemned. But He wants every man to hear this word. You know, sometimes people get the idea that, well, now, <clears throat> since man is generally rebellious and uh, he's not going to respond, why would the Lord require me uh, to go to the trouble of, of dissemination of truth or preaching the gospel or making known in all the world the good news? Uh, do you remember that Peter said uh, uh, Noah was a preacher of righteousness? What is that? Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Check me out on that. Uh, Noah was a preacher of righteousness? Right. What had God said to Noah? Oh, Genesis chapter 6. Man's days will be 120 years. I'm going to destroy all in whose nostrils is breathed the breath of life. That's because of their wickedness, their ungodly. Every thought and imagination of man's heart came to be only evil, and that continually repented God that He had made. He intended to destroy him. Wait now. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, right? Righteousness, Psalms 119, verse 172, Let my lips sing of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Well, if Noah was a preacher of righteousness, what did he preach to these people? There's going to be a flood. All in whose nostrils is breathed the breath of life uh, will perish. How successful was he? How many people did he save? Oh, just, just eight souls, Peter said, uh, himself, his wife, and their three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. Well, if, if I'd have been Noah, I'd have said, hey, I've got too much to do building the ark. I'm not doing that preaching. Nobody's paying it. What? No, you wouldn't. Not if you obey the Lord. You see, that's my responsibility. Just like the Lord said to Peter in John 21, verse 22, when Peter asked about John, if I will that he tarry till I come, that's none of your business. That has nothing to do with your relationship to me. If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. 
What did the Lord say to me as a follower of Christ? Preach the gospel. Preach what? Manual, discipline, uh, no, 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 politics, uh, no, 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 no. Gospel, book, chapter, and verse. Friends, the only possibility of human redemption is an understanding of the unmerited favor, the grace, yea, and the love of God that is exhibited in the sacrificial death and subsequent resurrection of His Son. That's all written right here in this book. And it is simple, understandable uh, terminology. We need to give our lives in humble obedience to Him who died to redeem our souls. Christ purchased the church with His blood. He built it. And we'll talk about that at a later time. May God bless. It has been a pleasure studying the Bible with you today. Would you be interested in learning more about God's Word? Well, we have a series of Bible lessons that you can study at home. Beautifully illustrated and based solely on the Bible, these studies can help you learn more about God's will for your life. Call us at 1-800-683-3120 or visit our website at preachingthegospeltv.com. While you're there, sign our guest book and let us know what you think of our program. You can email us at ptgwjw at aol.com or write to us at Preaching the Gospel, P.O. Box 1484, Dalton, Georgia, 30722. Audio cassettes of today's lesson are available free of charge. Just contact us with this program number shown on your screen. Members of the Church of Christ in your area have paid for this program and they would love for you to come and visit their services. If you need help locating a congregation in your area or if you would like more information about the church described in the Bible, please contact us. Preaching the Gospel is under the oversight of the elders at the Highland Church of Christ, Dalton, Georgia. And now, back to James Watkins. What is the church? Friends, it is comprised of the redeemed, those who have been purchased by the blood of Christ, those who, out of love for God, have in full recognition of their total dependence upon Him, bowed in submission, humble obedience to His will. Ah, then we're recipient of the promises predicated upon that action. It is marvelous what God has done for a sinner such as I. So love me that He let His Son die, that I through faith could come into a right relationship with Himself. Faith cometh of hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So that faith in Him as my Savior through Jesus Christ leads me to submit to His will. He's the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey Him. Friends, that obedience is a very simple matter. May God help us so to do.